Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Anne Ziff. Good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you all for being here as we learn about and celebrate the American Prairie Reserve. Some of you may know me from a different hat that I wear, which is chairman of the Metropolitan Opera. But this evening, I'm here as an advocate and a cheerleader for the American Prairie Reserve. I was fortunate enough last summer to be invited by Tom and Meredith Brokaw to the yurt camp. And it was one of the most wonderful experiences that I've ever had. I've been fortunate enough to take a lot of exotic trips and go to very interesting places around the world. And I would put the trip to the American Prairie Reserve right at the top of that list. You, it's, yeah, it's wonderful. You're gonna hear from Tom and Sean later, so I won't say more about that, but I'd like to introduce a video, a short one, that's done by National Geographic, and it will show you how beautiful and varied the landscape is, a landscape that soon will have abundant wildlife species roaming around. Here's the video. The American Prairie Reserve is the largest scale conservation project underway now in North America, one of the biggest in the world. The American Prairie Reserve project is preserving one of the fastest disappearing pieces of the American West. I think one of the things I'm most excited about is it's not too late. and Clark came through here a couple hundred years ago. About the time they got to the Montana border is where they saw the wildlife really begin to increase in abundance. Modern day conservation biology has said we've got to create vast reserves if we want to bring back all the wildlife in some of these areas. And that's why when we created the plans for the American Prairie Reserve, we decided to go large. Our, our ultimate dream is to have three to three and a half million acre fully functioning ecosystem where all the animals that were there 100 years ago, 150 years ago, have an opportunity to interact with each other again and have a major role and impact on the landscape. We're beginning to put things back onto that landscape. We're really excited to think about the day when it's all back in balance the way it was for thousands and thousands of years. We have reintroduced bison and currently have about 250 bison. Clearly we'll have the capacity to have the largest bison herd in the country. Mm -hmm. This is about the land and the wildlife but it's also about people. We're very interested in making this area accessible to the public. It has a lot of potential for its scenic value, for its birding. There is a lot of promise for local communities. There's a tourism aspect, just like you'd find in Africa, other parts of North America, South America when you build a reserve of this scale. If somebody had said, would you have liked to have been a founder or co-founder of Yellowstone Park, how could you not want to be on that team? It's an opportunity to be involved in creating something where you can see the tangible results of your efforts in your lifetime and have an altruistic sense of accomplishment. 
The American Prairie Reserve is critical to the existence of future generations. It feeds everything that is to be human. This is the time to seize it and secure it forever so it can be enjoyed for hundreds and hundreds of years. That gives you a taste of what you're going to see when you all visit, because I think you're going to be very tempted at the end of this evening. Sean Garrity has been president of the American Prairie Reserve since 2002. At that time, there were two people. There are now 40 employees. At that time, there was no money, and they've raised over $75 million so far. At that time, there was no land and there's now over 310,000 acres and growing all the time, thanks to the help of some of you in this room. When I had the pleasure of spending those three days at the yurt camp with Sean, I learned that he was from Montana, but he had spent 20 years of his life in Silicon Valley, co-founding a company which is still now going strong. 30 years later, he is now here running American Prairie Reserve for all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, Sean Garrity. Well, thank you, Anne, very much for the introduction and everything you've done to help make this evening a success already. I also uh, want to thank Meredith and Tom Brokaw and I want to thank the entire uh, host committee, the American Prairie Reserve Board of Directors, and our board chairman, George Matlich. They're the ones responsible for bringing you all together, so already is a success. It's a fantastic looking room, uh, room of people, and I've enjoyed meeting some of you. Look forward to meeting more of you when the evening's over and we go upstairs where we have some more things to show you. So Anne, when that movie clip she just showed, obviously we're building a very, very large reserve but there are no numbers in that, uh, in that video. It's 3.5 million acres we're shooting for. 5,000 5, square miles. That's kind of hard to get one's mind around. One, one, one anchor can be, it's about the same size of the entire state of Connecticut. Another is it's almost exactly the same size as Serengeti National Park in Africa. Perhaps though, more important than the size itself is the incredible rarity of the place where we're working. Scientists tell us there are only four places left on Earth to do a project of this scale on the grasslands. Only four places left. They're all being farmed at the edges and shrinking as we are here tonight. Time is of the essence. We're working up here in the Northern Great Plains. In fact, one very special spot in the Northern Great Plains that we believe is one of the most important, if not the best place to do a project like this anywhere on the planet. Now, the, st the stories of this wildlife-rich area have been moving along through oral tradition for thousands of years, on up through the current modern-day Native Americans that live around us there, the Grovant and the Assiniboine. And the essence of that story that all the tribes had known for a long time was this is where the game was. And the, the Hadatsas and Mandans, uh, crows and Blackfeet rode for hundreds and hundreds of miles to all come and hunt here in this wildlife-rich area. People first started writing about this area in the 1700s and then passing their writings around the stories around the world. They were French fur trappers who came into what now is called the Missouri Breaks area of this country. About 50 years after they came, Lewis and Clark in 1803, as you know on their journey, a 4,000 mile round trip, they walked and boated from St. Louis to the Pacific coast and back and when they wrote in their journals to the president at the time, Thomas Jefferson, they said on our entire project, our entire journey, we saw nothing that could compare to the wildlife phenomenon we saw here in this 200 mile stretch of the Missouri River. Those inspired other people, even people from Europe, ended up in the 1830s coming on safari to America's Great Plains. 
One such visitor was a young German painter named Karl Bodmer. He came to right where we're working now in the Missouri Breaks, painted over 50 images there, and he and his companions said too, the Americans ought to save this before it's all gone. It's spectacular. Well, many of you know what happened from 1850 to 1900. We went just the opposite with wildlife in this country. In the area where we're working, this Connecticut Serengeti-sized space, every one of these species you see here and more were completely eradicated, 100% gone. Every bear, wolf, elk, bighorn sheep, hundreds of thousands of bison, all gone. But we think with an innovative approach to this, using a public-private partnership to assemble the land, and sound science to bring the wildlife, coax those wildlife populations back up, we can create a scene like this again today in a massive landscape and save it for future generations. Now, while there's bad news happening for wildlife in that latter part of the 1800s, there was some very good news happening as well. And it started right here in New York City. Some progressive thinkers like George Berg Grinnell, Teddy Roosevelt, and others came up with the idea of our national parks. And together, starting in New York, they started what was to become a golden age of large-scale conservation in this country. It began in the 1870s with Yellowstone National Park, and then came to an end in about 1950 with the last big one we've done, that was Grand Teton. Interestingly though, they passed over the grasslands at that time. And the grasslands, because of the amazing forage availability, has a carrying capacity for wildlife that exceeds all of those other parks combined. Our intention, right up there in, north, in, uh, in uh, northeastern Montana, is to build the largest that's ever been done, a million acres bigger than Yellowstone Park, put all the wildlife back, and save it for future generations. Now, when you're doing something with this kind of ambition, as anybody in business or any kind of enterprise you might run know, you need to stay focused. We focus on three really important areas, always. One is putting the landscape together. You need a lot of land for this kind of a model. And then when you get to the land, you have to do a, a remodeling project to get ready to carry all that wildlife again. And then we're thinking about people now, the people in the surrounding area who live and work there and the people who are beginning to visit. We want to do that now, not waiting until we're finished in the years ahead. Starting with the land accumulation, it's important to understand the leverage aspect we get to enjoy is how lands are managed there. The green you're seeing is managed by the Fish and Wildlife Service, the million acres. The tan that you see there is Bureau of Land Management land, public land, about two and a half million acres inside that oval. Again, that oval is about the size of the Serengeti. Now the white, the white is private acres, and that's what American Prairie Reserve is buying up in bits and pieces, eventually 500,000 private acres, which we'll then use as a catalyst to glue together these existing public lands, take down thousands of miles of barbed wire fence, and make, create one seamlessly managed reserve. Now to date, we've been at it a while. To date, uh, we have closed 17 very large scale property deals. We have three more in the pipeline right now. We add about 25,000 acres per year to this project. It's moving fast. An important thing about these areas of blue that we're managing now, each one of them in its own right is ecologically significant. Each one of those land bases you're seeing is the size of many of our existing national parks. But imagine as we purchase more, glue together more, create the wildlife corridors, and it all comes together the way we've been describing into one 5,000 acre area. Now we're gonna have a wildlife phenomenon the likes of which this country hasn't seen for more than 200 years. That middle arrow, the restoration aspect, we use something called the Frazee scale to measure ourselves with. The Frazee scale describes a holistic, fully functioning, high quality grassland ecosystem. It has nine distinct parts to it. You rate it on a scale of one to seven, it's very easy. And then points us in the direction on a particular piece of land what we then need to do, like bring, new, bring species back that have been missing for a long time, like bison and swift fox, taking down hundreds of miles of fence, maybe even reinstituting fire on the landscape and many other things. If, as Ann suggested, you're gonna come and see us, and I hope you will, you'll be able to see lots of these projects in action that are going on every day. Looking at the people, aspect of this. That's a, that green part there, that 5,000 square miles, that's a big piece of land. And as you know in life, context is everything. Our context that we're surrounded with in that purple section that's about 50 to 100 miles thick is not the timber industry, it's not a fishing industry, it's cattle industry. 
More than 250 cattle producers raising half a million head of cattle at the edge of what's going to be this big wildlife reserve. So how do we make them uh, players in this whole idea and how do they benefit from it? Not many reserves around the world uh, have done a very nice job of this. We have numerous ideas in the queue. One that's already out of the gate and actually working quite well for the past year, something called Wild Sky Beef. That's a for-profit company we opened that's run by our nonprofit. The idea with Wild Sky is we take grass-fed, all-natural uh, uh, Angus cattle, sell it all over the United States, you can buy Wild Sky in New York, and we take the profits and we roll it back to the ranchers in that purple area there, and we pay them annual premiums for becoming more and more wildlife friendly with their management. Now the really interesting thing, I think, is these ranchers are using the exact same thing we use to benchmark our success, the Frazee scale. So the conservationists and the ranchers ha are defining success the same way and measuring themselves the same way. Both entities win in this kind of a situation. We get our core reserve of the quality that we'd like, but we also get this very soft boundary surrounded by an industry that's becoming more and more wildlife friendly every year. The ranchers win because they make more money each year as they move up on that scale doing what they want to do, which is raising and selling cattle. Let's take a look at the other part of the human element or people, and that's folks who have been coming uh, for the last five or six years or even a little bit longer from around the world to see this, just as Anne was telling you about. We want to make sure everybody, uh, no matter what their economic class is, can come and enjoy this place. To that end, we built our first campground. It's become very popular. It's $10 a night. We'll build many more and spread them across the entire reserve area. Another thing we're adding in is the concept of trekking, like you can do in South America, you may have done in Europe, etc. cetera. Uh, this year, for instance, in September, myself and a small group of travelers will walk 250 miles across the entire reserve area in about 15 days. We'll be walking through some beautiful areas. We'll see bison, we'll see prairie dogs, elk, grassland birds. And if you notice real close, we're not carrying any heavy packs. That's important. Some days we'll be walking, some days we'll be biking through this area. And we'd like to invite you, numerous people are coming on certain two or three or four day sections with us as you'd like. Important thing to know how we do trekking. When you think about where camp is gonna be that night, when we arrive, the tents and beds are already set up, the beer is on ice and dinner is on the grill. The next morning when we bike or walk away, magically it gets packed up, leapfrogs us, and reappears on the prairie miles down the road for our next evening. Another interesting way people are, another portal people are coming through to this, to, uh, this, uh, this reserve now is we're very happy about this. This is our brand new Danny, Joey, and Gigi Enrico Education and Science Center. We just built it, it's already open. We have 16 different programs booked into it this year already. It's become very popular almost instantly. By the way, I wanna, I wanna thank Rosemary and Roger Enrico and their family members who are here tonight for giving the gift that allowed us to build this 7,000 square foot building. Thank you very much. One of the programs coming is from New York City. It's called, students, or it's called Sponsors of Educational Opportunity. Some of the folks are here tonight. It's directed by William Goodlow. The chairman is Henry Kravis. We'll be taking some underserved youth from the Queens and from Bronx in just about a month. They come to Montana. They'll be joined by Native American students the same age, about 17 years old. And they will have themselves a two week long experience out there with our naturalist guide and scientists that I think they won't soon forget. And you heard Ann talking about sleeping in a tent in Montana. These are the tents she may have told you about. <laughs> Inside, a uh, little different than some tents, all climate controlled, hot and cold running water, shower, bathroom, very nice thread count on the sheets. I'll sit and let you look at this for a minute. Actually, it's, uh, it's really important. Like when you tour in Africa, we want you to be comfortable. You'll be out with our guides in the element all day long, seeing bison and seeing other animals, learning about the project is now and the incredible area we, place we hope to take it soon. This is a very hands-on experience, by the way. So if you're beginning to think about it, think about your kids and grandchildren. Lots of people bring their kids or their grandchildren or both. 
It's very high touch, and our guides out there, their goal, they talk to that level of, of, of youth, their goal is to light them up about being in nature once again. Sometimes we have uh, uh, visiting guides from Fort Belknap Indian Reservation. This is George Horse Capture Jr., a very good friend of ours, telling someone about how his people have been there for 25 generations at a minimum, and what's like, what, what their history is like there. So you come back from all your touring with our guides each day, and you get cleaned up in your tent, come join us in the gathering area, get ready to have a nice meal together uh, out here in this incredibly remote area, and then see what the evening brings. Sometimes we'll have the wildcat dancers come from uh, uh, the uh, uh, Fort Bell Napping Reservation and spend the evening with us. Sometimes people just take a drink and sit out on the, on the deck and take a look at the view. You can see for 100 miles with no telephone poles, no lights, no cars, no buildings. And that's a rare experience indeed. Sometimes our bison, which are over 600 of them now, come quietly up to visit in the late evening. They'll drift right through camp. It's pretty exciting when a 2,000-pound bull comes over to scratch his back on one of the uprights and shakes the entire yurt that you're standing on. It's fun. The key is, when, no matter where you stay with us, we want to get you out on this plains area, the grasslands that most people don't realize even can exist in the United States anymore, to enjoy the coyotes howling and the owls hooting and just simply be out in nature again, giving yourself a gift of time, of just slowing down with each other. So, uh, and if you're lucky, like many of us who have been out, who are out there a lot, uh, every once in a while you'll have a treat of the aurora borealis, the northern lights right from the prairie itself. So I think, as uh, I hope you'll take away from this evening, is this project, the story of it is moving around the world very rapidly, thanks in big part to our friends at National Geographic, as well as other publications. And I think the reputation it's beginning to get is certainly its audacious size but the holistic approach of focusing that purple area, trying to make sure the people who live and work in that area are winners too and actually help move it forward. <clears throat> By the way, um, so with this project, which I believe is on its way to success for sure, we hope to inspire a new era of large-scale conservation, not only here in this country, but around the world. It's been 14 years since we started, and now, increasingly, people everywhere are starting to view this effort as a prime example of American persistence, passion, and ingenuity in action. Once again, we really appreciate you coming out uh, to be with us here tonight. Thank you. I now have the distinct privilege and what's a real honor to me to introduce someone who truly needs no introduction, the remarkable and the totally lovable Tom Brokaw. Thank you all very much. Uh, that phrase, totally lovable, and did not check it with Meredith before I arrived here tonight. But speaking of totally lovable, let's just take a moment and think about where we are on this occasion in which we want to learn more about the glories of the American West. We're at the American Museum of Natural History, founded by Theodore Roosevelt, who went west and understood the importance of this country, preserving all the specimens, not just of the American West, but of the world as well. You are sitting in a repository one of the greatest collections of natural history in the history of mankind. And on the fifth floor, the most important scientific work is being done every day by postdoctoral fellows and others now involved in the Genome Project. So I can't think of a better place to bring together the combination of the American West in its most primitive form and the obligation that we all have as, as citizens and as scientists to advance the knowledge of everyone. And this institution is at the crux of that. It is at the intersection of it. And presiding over the intersection is Ellen Futter, who is here tonight with us, and I want to give her a big round of applause. I 
I've been thinking a lot recently, uh, in part because of my advancing age, about the genius of this country. And it seems to me that it comes down to one central idea. America is the product of a big idea. The big idea came with those founding fathers and founding families who came here determined to settle a primitive and wild land, but to do more than that, to create a new form of self-rule. Thomas Jefferson, who was the author of The Biggest Idea, the Declaration of Independence, knew as an intellectual and intuitively that citizenship does not depend on birthright or uh, being on the winning side in a war, that we're all born with certain unalienable rights, as he put it. And he extended that in his own life, not just as a citizen, but as a man who was a steward of all that was around him. He was a vintner and a botanist and a scientist. He was an educator. And he was, even given the people who were in this room and in this city during this time of a great boom, he was the greatest real estate broker in the history of America. <laughs> he arranged for the Louisiana Purchase from St. Louis to the Pacific Ocean through the American Savannah, the place that we're talking about here tonight, across the mountains and onto the coastal plains. Lewis and Clark, the most adventurous exploration of America in this young country's history. Now, Meredith and I grew up on the Great Plains. We are the children of the Dakota Territory. Now, I have to tell you that Meredith grew up in the city. She grew up in Yankton. I grew up in a smaller town and a succession of them across the Dakota Territory. But we find ourselves, when we return there, each rooted to that land that gave us such succor not just as citizens and as the children of people who came there and broke the ground, but as people who were replenished by what was all around us. I don't think that we had a full appreciation at the time of all that had gone before we arrived, and it wasn't that many more, many years. Lewis and Clark on the Great Waterway of America, the Missouri River, in which I lived on the bluffs of that river all the time until I was 24 years of age. They used that waterway to explore the American Savannah, the Great Plains, the prairie. And every day they found something new. New indigenous people, new forms of wildlife, large and small, plants and grasses, trees and shrubs, heretofore unknown. They were the first explorers commissioned by our president to see a prairie dog or an antelope or to see the elk that wandered across the Great Plains at that time, the grizzly bears. They could stand on a small knoll and look for miles across the prairie and it was unbroken by herds of bison. Switchgrass. When I was growing up and hiking with my 22 and camping out on the hills along the Missouri River, we'd have to be careful about cactus and the different kinds of dry grass because it was a semi-arid ground. But at the same time, there were beautiful groves of cedar trees that existed there. I would spend my days along the Missouri River retrieving ancient bison skulls that came off the bottom and Indian artifacts and remembering what it must have been like when Lewis and Clark passed by the very place where I was growing up. America was expanding, of course, at that time, not just physically and politically, but biologically as well. Still, so much of the land remains as Lewis and Clark found it in the northern prairie and especially in the heart of the prairie reserve. We're not just the heirs or the beneficiaries. We really are the stewards of that land. Meredith and I left South Dakota because we were seeking bright lights in big cities. And we've been very happy urban dwellers ever since, in part because at least once a year and more often than if we can arrange it, we return to the American savannah, to the prairie, and to the draws and the rivers of our beloved state of Montana as well. 
We're always struck by when we invite friends from the East to come visit us. Their kind of jaw-dropping reaction to what they are seeing. They've spent their summers in Europe, for example, or maybe in Africa. And they all but say, my God, how long has this been here? <laughs> I'll never forget a famous Washington newspaper editor who came via Yellowstone Park not too long after the most horrendous fires in that park's history, so far as we know, and said to me, when did that happen? And I said, it was on the front page of your newspaper for about three months. So those of us who are gathered here from the urban environs have a responsibility, not just to the Prairie Reserve, but to that part of America and to make sure that others appreciate it as well. That's our legacy. That's why we're here. And that responsibility is more than a night at a dinner, as important as this is, and however much we welcome you. It is because at these troubled times in our lives, I suspect that many of us are wondering, how will our generation be remembered? What is our big idea? Or are we just a part of society now that is taking and not giving back and not caring about this precious place called North America and the United States, one of the most extraordinary pieces of geography known around this planet. We are citizens for who we are, not just because of birthright or because we are on the winning side of a war, but as citizens, we do have, it seems to me, a birthright obligation to preserve, protect, and advance all the glories of this precious nation, natural and man-made. The laws and culture that bind us are recent creations, but the American West, from the volcanic creation of Yellowstone to the hard rock upheavals of Yosemite, these are the ancient works of nature and evolution. And there is nothing that is more completely preserved than the prairie. It is a garden of life, large and small. It is a place where you will go and see bison and field mice, bald eagles and curlews. It is a place where the predators still roam at night and you can hear for them. And the question is, who speaks for them? Who will care for them? If not us, who? I'll leave you with one final story. We have, as many of you know, a place in Montana, and I am constantly renewed by what I witnessed there. And one of the extraordinary occasions for me came about nine years ago in the late spring when the water was high in the river and we knew that the elk cows had calved by then. And I was standing on an overlook where there was a group of cottonwood trees off to the left and a fast current leading to the good grass where we knew the elk would like to graze during the summertime. Out of the cottonwood trees came about probably a dozen elk cows, all accompanied by a calf, born not so long ago. They looked at me briefly and decided I was not any kind of a threat. And then one by one, a cow and a calf waded into the swift current and tried to make it up the other side. And the calves had to scramble because there were thick bushes there. And all of them made it except one. And that calf was swept downstream. And then I was trying to decide what to do, and he found a back current, got up on a sandbar. And the mothers and the other children were watching from the far bank. He made his way back to the beginning place, he tried again, and failed again. Tried again, and failed a third time. Now, by the third time, this poor calf was trembling, exhausted, cold, and walked back up. And as God is my witness, his mother stepped into the river, nodded her majestic head, waded across, nuzzled him, and led him to a safer place. And they crossed together. And the herd was reunited. And they went up over the hill 
into the grassland that would feed them for the summer. And I stood there in utter awe of all that I had learned in just that moment, of how nature treats us by teaching us to take care of each other. And we have no greater obligation than to take care of them. Thank you all very much for being here tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tom, very much for those amazing words. And I think you, uh, you pinpointed very well the whole reason we're doing the American Prairie Reserve Project, as some of you are getting to know. What Tom, that story Tom told is, as he talked about what nature has to teach us, uh, there's, a, there's a key set of conditions there. He had to stop the busyness of his life, go, in this case, to Montana. And, and enjoy the quiet and the stillness and create space and put himself in a place of possibility to actually see those elk do that. You actually, uh, you actually have to show up and uh, put yourself in that place of possibility and then you have those kinds of rewards. Just a beautiful, beautiful story, Tom. Thank you very much for your words and encouraging people to take a closer look at what we're doing. Um, I think, uh, as he said, as people come out and say in this area of Montana, how long has this been here? I was talking to our table just a few minutes ago. When people come out and they stand on that deck at Kestrel Camp, the most common thing, and I hear it almost every trip, and I'm on a lot of trips out there, they look out there over 100 miles and they go, I had no idea that a place like this, this big, with the kind of potential you're talking about, existed in the lower 48 states. Everybody says that. So like Tom taking the time to go see and put himself in a position to have that beautiful experience with elk, I hope you'll figure out a way to uh, carve out time for yourselves to be out there in the quiet and the silence and uh, put yourselves in a place of possibility. So I want to thank everybody again, uh, uh, the host committee in particular, to pull everybody like this together. We so much appreciate you being here. Don't leave. It's not over. Uh, there's a party upstairs up there. Frank, we want you to come join us. If you'd like to learn about any of the things that I talked about, the, the campground, the trek, the whatever, we have actual spots where you can go get information on all those things, and many of our staff are here to describe things and answer details. We also have luscious Ethel M. chocolates, thanks to one of our board members, Jackie Mars. Thank you very much, Jackie, for doing that. She's here tonight. She'll be passing out the chocolates up there, I think. And we have American Prairie Reserve private, private label bourbon right next to the chocolates. I'm throwing everything at you to get you to stay. <laughs> you can come meet Ann, talk to Meredith and Tom, myself, lots of our staff. There are employees of American Prairie Reserve who live on this landscape. Look for Betty, look for Damien. And uh, we'd just love to have you stay. We didn't have time to meet everybody beforehand. Please stay with us uh, and, uh, and uh, come up and uh, see everything we have to offer up there. Thank you so much for coming. Look forward to talking to you upstairs. Thank you.